We've had a few requests from people asking about bridge cameras. Should you upgrade from a bridge camera to a digital SLR? Is it an upgrade from a bridge camera to a DSLR? And it's something we've been thinking about for a while. And then a very nice chap called Zoran, who lives in Zagreb in Croatia, phoned me about a week or so ago and, and asked me this very question. So we thought, right, we'd better get on and make this film. I think the difference between a, a bridge camera like this and a DSLR is pretty much the same as that between a man and a woman. For example, I'm sitting here in the sun thinking how incredibly warm it is for January, whereas Jane, if I can get hold of this, has come dressed for a polar expedition. Anyway, enough nonsense. Let's have a look. The, the, the bridge camera I've chosen to talk about is a Canon G9. It's a very, very good quality bridge camera. It's now been superseded, I think, by a G10. There's possibly a G11, I'm not sure. This is about four years old and I borrowed it from a friend of mine. I particularly like it because it's robust, it feels pretty solid, and it has many digital SLR features. For example, I've got a dedicated ISO wheel on the top here. I can very quickly change my ISOs if I need to, to enable me to get apertures or shutter speeds that I need. I don't want to be ferreting around in the back in a menu. I've also got a DSLR style control wheel here. We've got video, high frame rate, scenes, auto, program mode. We've got time value or shutter priority, aperture value, aperture priority, full manual, and there's a couple of custom settings too, which you could set up in the menus if you wanted to, so you've got your own custom shooting things. I can even change all the stuff I could on my DSLR, such as white balance, I can change picture modes, I can change bracketing, I can control the flash output, I can change the metering modes, and it's even got a built-in neutral density filter. I only have to press a button to bring that up rather than fit it on the end of the lens, such as I would with a DSLR. And this one I can also tell to shoot in RAW mode, which I find incredibly useful because I want to be in charge of how my pictures look rather than let the camera process them. This camera also has a little optical viewfinder which I can look through like this so I can see what's going on. I can use it to compose my shots. The LCD is very very hard to look at particularly on a bright day like this. Now in the back here I've brought up all those controls I just mentioned and they've just gone off let's bring them back again but they're really hard to see in this light. I don't expect you can see them at all can you? Can you see that Janie? No, I've got a no from Jane. That's because the light level out here is very bright and this little LCD is competing with the sun. That's why they're hard to look at. The only way you can see these properly, of course, is to be in shade or on a dull day. So for me to see this accurately, I've got to hide under my coat. I don't know if you can see it if I hide under my coat, Janie. How's that? Yeah, I can see it a little bit better. Reflections are tricky, but... Yeah. The reason that worked is because when we went into shade, Jane opened the iris of the camera, which is the same as your pupil getting wider when you go into shade, so you can see it properly. It's just the same for the camera as it is for us with our eyes. So on the surface, this looks like to be a very great little thing. I've got nearly all the availability of functions and features and can do pretty much anything a DSLR can do, but it's all in this little tiny package instead of this great big heavy bag. However, there are limitations. Even though I can control my apertures and my shutter speeds, I don't have very many apertures or shutter speeds available to work with. For example, the aperture range on this camera is from f2.8, which is a very wide aperture indeed in DSLR terms, but the minimum aperture is only f8. And when I zoom the lens, that 2.8 becomes 4.8. So I've only got half a dozen, what, three, four aperture sizes to play with. And Therefore, that's going to have an impact on the way my pictures look. And for me, that's the business end of photography. I want to control how my pictures look. Let's go and give it a go. And he came out of the light. I'm just going to build a picture. So let's have a go. Let's put a couple of little rocks down here. We've got lots of nice beachiness going on. We've got some great angled sunlight, which I think will look really great. And this is actually a good little exercise in lighting. The light on me is horrible right now, isn't it? But on these stones, it's perfect. This is like the appropriate light. You wouldn't want to photograph me in this light. 
but those puppies are gonna work well. Now, let's grab my bridge camera. I'm gonna use aperture priority because that's what I would normally use on my DSLR. I'm gonna set an ISO of 200. The shot I wanna take will be of these pebbles and the beach and the blue sky and I think I'll make a nice picture, particularly if I make the background a little bit soft. So I can dial my aperture out wide to f2.8. And this is the bit I don't like, so I've got to look through this. I've got to look in this LCD to see what's going on. Now I'm going to focus my shot. I'm having a bit of trouble focusing. And this is where it gets fiddly with bridge cameras. So to change my focus point, I have to press that. And then I can move where the camera's going to focus around. I think that's it. Yes, it is. Now, focus on... Why won't you focus? Why won't you focus? Why won't you focus? That's really, really irritating. I cannot get the camera to focus where I want it to. So let's have a go with manual focus because it has a manual focus setting. I looked at the book about manual focus settings before I came out and there's pages of it. This is a downside of bridge cameras as far as I'm concerned because they are incredibly fiddly. There are two pages of how to use manual focus and it cross-references from the page you're on to about five different pages to bring you back to do your manual focus. Why? When on a DSLR you've got a nice little focusing ring on the end of the lens, you just do that, job done. Right, let's have another go. So I'm in manual focus. So let's see if we can do it. Then there's a little focus wheel I can supposedly turn, but I can't see in the LCD whether that's sharp or not. I really don't know if that's making any... Oh, I think that's sharp. So let's have a go. No, it's lost the focus. So how do I make it focus? No. Let's try again. And it doesn't seem to matter, by the way, whether I'm back here or over there. This is what I mean by they're fiddly. It's okay for a very generic shot, but I'm having a lot of trouble with this. Another thing which I'm bumping into is exposure. Because of the limited numbers of shutter speeds and apertures, I've chosen ISO 200 because I want pretty good image quality. I've chosen the widest aperture, which is f2.8. But as soon as I press the button, it tells me that I can't take that picture without it being completely overexposed. Do you know what? It's just focused and I have no idea why. <laughs> I promise you I am a bit of a bumbling idiot when it comes to techie things, but I'm not that bad. I have no idea why that chose to focus at that moment. But as you can see from the shot, it's overexposed. Why is that? It's because this camera hasn't got enough shutter speeds to work with the wide aperture to get the blurred background that I want for my shot. I've got a slightly soft background, but the shot's a bit overexposed. If I had more shutter speeds, so let's say my shutter speed was more than a two thousandth of a second, then that faster shutter speed would mean I could use that wider aperture. And this is what I mean by limitations. So the other thing I could do is to turn my ISO dial round to 80 ISO. So that it should be a very fine image quality indeed. Let's see if we can focus this time. Oh, it has. I don't know why that is. There we go. This time I got the shot perfectly. The, the, the stones are sharp and you can see that it's correctly exposed. But you have to juggle these things all the time to try and make sure your shots work. Let's have a quick look at macro. If I pop her into macro mode, and I'm hoping this one works because I tried this yesterday as well, I should be able to get very close to these stones indeed and get quite an interesting, yeah, that worked, shot like that. Yeah, now that's a really close in, quite dramatic. I really rather like that. To do that with the DSLR, I can't get quite that close. Dig out a DSLR, here we go. Super wide, I've got the lens as wide as it'll go, I've got my aperture as wide as it'll go. In this case, it's 3.5. But I can't focus that close. Let's see, the closest I can focus to these Little, little puppies on the stone here. 
is there and no there I'm moving a tiny bit at a time there it is that's as close as I can get with this lens so I can obviously focus much much closer with the bridge camera however I can still do it with this all I have to do is to pop on a macro lens or use one of my old favorites a close-up filter you don't really need to watch me do that I think I've got the point across the thing is I can use any old ISO that I like because I can change my, my shutter speed range is so much greater I can get a five thousandth of a second shutter speed so I can use as wide an aperture as I want and still get the shot that I want and if I'm having trouble focusing instead of having to ferret around with buttons and knobs and menus all I have to do is rotate this little ring here my focusing ring and I can see through the viewfinder when it's in focus not only that in the viewfinder I can see a little dot which tells me when it's in focus I can't do that with the bridge camera let's go and take a look at the other end of the lens spectrum let's have a look at the long end shall we the more astute amongst you may have noticed I've put my jacket back on because it has got a little bit blowier and also I don't want anyone to nick it if I leave it lying on the beach so the shot we did just now we used a wide angle lens wide lenses inherently have the most depth of field but with that 2.8 aperture combined with being very close to the subject we managed to get a blurred background you have far less depth of field with a long lens and that's why they're great for portraits or for isolating your subject so let's do a little comparison between the two I really like this pole here I like the light coming across it these sort of you know this weathered wood we've got these slightly seedy looking beach huts up here and a lovely blue sky going on behind them so the shot I want to take the one that's in my head is of this timber fairly strong in the foreground a bit as though a bit as if it was a portrait of this piece of wood but I want the beach huts in the sky to be a little bit soft so to do that I'm going to use a slightly longer lens in fact I'm going to go to the the full whack the lens on the bridge camera has a focal length equivalent to 35 millimeters to 210 so when I switch the camera on we're going to zoom, let's get it set up zoom the lens on out I need to set up my focus point so we don't want the same shenanigans as we had before so I'm moving around in the back of the camera to tell it where I want it to focus I don't know can you see that Janie can you see that little green square there and open the exposure a bit no other way can you see that can you see that no all right never mind we'll do a cutaway of it for you in a minute so I've got to set up where I want it to focus which is going to be about there I'm telling the camera where I'm going to put the pole in the viewfinder because that's what I've got to do to make sure it focuses where I want it I think I press function and that should have set it there has it yes it has good I want my lens at the full 210 mil zoom something which is a little irritating on this there is no indication as to how much zoom I've got with the DSLR the zoom magnification is on the barrel here why is that useful if I'm using a 200 mm lens and want to avoid camera shake I need to make sure I'm using at least a 200th of a second shutter speed now even though this has built-in image stabilizing I still like to know what my shutter speed should be in order to ensure a sharp picture and I can't do that with this because nowhere does it tell me what my focal length is set to I don't know if you can see the zoom going in and out you can't see in the back there though can you Jenny yeah, oh you bit. can tiny bit there's this little sort of slider graph here but it's not telling me what my focal length is anyway I know from the book that's a 210 mil lens I want a blurred background so I'm going to use the widest aperture I can use with that lens in this case it's f4.8 it's only going to give me from f4.8 to f8 this is what I mean by this limited range and I find that really frustrating but even so f4.8 with a 210mm lens in theory should give me a very blurred background 
let's get my DSLR out. Now to get f4.8 with a DSLR I've got to use my killer death professional lens because my consumer lens doesn't go that far. So we're at 200 millimeters f4.8 I'm still shooting at 200 ISO so therefore everything is set the same. I might have to get a little bit wet to get this shot because to make those elements line up I've got to go down here. So let's see what happens. Hopefully I can do it quickly. Oh dear. Bang that round my neck. Let's see what happens. Right, DLR first because I know that'll be quick. I don't have to dance around with my focusing. I can just focus, compose, shoot. There's my DSLR shot, cool. Let's pop that on the beach. Now my bridge shot. Wake up the camera. Compose my shot. Where's the pole gone? There it is. Now the focal length is very slightly, it seems to be slightly different on this one. Nah, that's interesting. Even though it's a 210 equivalent, I've got to move further back. Yeah. This is one of the sacrifices you have to make to get the shot that you want. There we go. They're not quite identical, but you'll get my point. Did you notice how much of a faff it was for me to take the shot with a bridge camera to make it focus, to get the composition compared to this, where I can just point it, focus it, shoot it. If we look at the DSLR image, you can see that the beach huts are a little bit soft and fuzzy in the background. Look at the bridge camera shot, and the beach huts are almost as sharp as the pole is. So why is that? Bridge cameras have very, very small sensors compared to a digital SLR, particularly a full frame digital SLR. When you have a very small sensor, but with the same focal length of lens, your depth of field expands. So therefore, if you want to create a blurred background with a portrait, it is going to be much more difficult with a bridge camera than it would be with a digital SLR. I know I sound really clever for that, but actually I had to phone up my mate Adam Scorey and ask him how it all works yesterday. So, if you want to start isolating things in the background, but you're not up really close to them, a bridge camera is going to make it very, very difficult. Oh, one of Zoran's questions, by the way, which I haven't answered, was if you're using exposure compensation on a digital SLR, how do you know if you've got it right? Because on the bridge camera, when you change your exposure compensation, you can actually see it getting brighter or darker in the LCD, provided, of course, it's not a bright sunny day and you can see the LCD properly. You can't on my DSLR. Some more entry-level DSLRs, you possibly can see it changing the exposure. But it's not a big deal. All you have to do is to press your exposure compensation button, dial it in a little bit, take the picture, look at it. Now, if you're doing this with kids running around everywhere, you just make sure you have your exposure compensation set before you start shooting, because it's not going to change much. If you were running around in this area in front of me now, the light's going to be the same, unless the sun's going in and out. If you then turned over there, I just have to do a retest shot and do it again. So in conclusion, Bridge cameras, in my opinion, are incredibly fiddly. I think they're a workup. I think they're much, much harder to use than a digital SLR. Manufacturers are trying to cram too many things into one little box, and that means you have to start using the same button to do different jobs by pressing them in different combinations. If you're really techy and you like reading manuals, then I would say a bridge camera is probably a good way to go for you. I'm not. I want to get my pictures as quickly and as simply as possible. And the thing with a DSLR is that there are some fundamentals you do have to learn, but actually a DSLR is a lot less complex than a bridge camera. So is one better than the other? Well, I still have to say, despite the fiddle and the faff of this, there are times I don't want to lug this big heavy bag around, in which case something like the G9, G10, I would say is probably quite a good complement to a digital SLR, because you can just shove it in your pocket when you go for a walk on the beach. So hopefully that's helped a bit and given you some kind of an insight into the differences between bridges and digital SLRs. Bridges are limited. Digital SLRs kind of expand exponentially. 
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be notified each time we upload one of our cool photography videos, or for more great photo tips, workshops and training, come and see us at our website, photographycourses.biz.